Chapter 3, Confessions Victoria began to emerge from her unconsciousness, to open her eyes slowly, lying on her bed, woke up and saw Miss Scarrett bending over her, with a look of interest and concern on her face. Is your majesty, all right? Does it feel good, majesty? Scarrett asked with sincere concern for the queen. Suddenly the queen, still confused, remembered the reason of her present state, of her fainting, and altered grabbed Miss Scarrett by an arm, and with panic on her face asked. Lord Melbourne. Is D? She could not finish the question because she felt that the air was lacking and the heart was going to leave by the mouth. Quiet your majesty. Lord Melbourne is alive, do not fear, he's alive, Scarrett answered in a sweet, reassuring voice. Victoria caught her breath and her eyes filled with tears. Thank God. But. How is he? Victoria asked anxiously. I'm sorry, your majesty, he's still ill. He stays in bed, in a guest bedroom, and the doctors are still treating him, Scarrett replied, regretting that she was the bearer of bad news. Victoria pushed aside the sheets and moved her legs to place bare feet on the floor. Help me get dressed Scarrett. Said Victoria. Your Majesty, please wait. The doctors said that you should eat something to regain strength, please let me call Baroness Lazen first. Said pleadingly Scarrett. Scarrett, I'm going to see Lord Melbourne. I imagine the palace has already been secured and there is no danger to me so there is no reason not to leave my bedroom. You'll help me get dressed, and then you'll take me to Lord Melbourne, immediately, Victoria replied in a tone that held no discussion. Yes, Majesty, of course, answered Scarrett obediently and sympathetically. When Scarrett was dressing Victoria, Lazen arrived and saw them with a mixture of worry and anger. Majesty. Miss Scarrett, why did not you tell me that the Queen woke up? said Lazen. I ordered her, Lazen, I wanted her to dress me immediately, Victoria replied. Your Majesty. You should stay in bed, you're still weak. Lazen replied. Lazen, I'm going to see Lord Melbourne. And I'll see it now. Victoria said with a tone of authority mixed with concern. Of course, Majesty, said Lazen understanding that she would gain nothing by arguing with her beloved Victoria in that situation. A few moments later Victoria, accompanied by Lazen and Scarrett, reached the bedroom door where Lord Melbourne stood, Victoria exchanged a quick word with Lord Alfred and the doctor, the Queen's official doctor, who had headed the team of doctors who operated Lord Melbourne. Then the doctor opened the bedroom door and stepped aside for Victoria to enter with Lazen and Scarrett seeing Lord Melbourne in bed, looking deplorable, his face very emaciated and pale, unconscious, leaning on several pillows and breathing heavily, Victoria felt her legs fail her, and Scarrett and Lazen had to hold her, one of them of each arm, discreetly, so that it would not fall to the floor. But Victoria regained her balance and was able to release her, although her face was very pale and in her mortified gesture could read the pain she felt. Her eyes were wet and she had to restrain himself from crying. Your Majesty, you don't look well, you should go back to your bedroom to rest and eat some. I'll prescribe some medicine so you can get some sleep, said the doctor, looking worried. You're very kind, but I'm fine, doctor. Tell me, will Lord Melbourne save himself? Will he live? Victoria asked, trying to remain steady but her voice was broken and she could not help letting a tear slip away. It is too soon to know, ma'am, replied the doctor, feeling as if he were responding to the wife of a patient whose life was in danger, with pity and discomfort for the pain he caused to a grieving woman, he has fever and has not recovered the conscience, is a strong man and we did a good job with the surgery, but with this type of injuries we don't know, we will have to wait a few days maybe a few weeks to know for sure if he will survive and rule out any complications, such as some internal damage that we have not detected or an infection. I understand, I am very grateful for your work and that of your colleagues, Victoria replied, looking desperately at Lord Melbourne, please, 
everyone but Miss Scarrett leave the bedroom, I want to watch over Lord Melbourne's dream a few minutes, it's the least I can do for him after saving my life, Victoria added. Those present exchanged significant looks, and began to withdraw, but Lazen remained in her place, Victoria turned to look at her. You, too, Lazen, please, Victoria said in a tone that demanded understanding, but at the same time did not admit no discussion. Lazen saw Victoria with a certain astonishment, replaced immediately by a look of slight reproach, then she saw Scarat, and her almost shrugged at the Baroness's expression. Finally, Lazen left the bedroom and closed the door, leaving Victoria and Scarat alone with Lord Melbourne. Almost at once Victoria approached Lord Melbourne's bed and sat on it, lay on it, and rested her head on Lord Melbourne's chest, and she broke down to weep bitterly. Lord M, Lord M, my love, my life! exclaimed Victoria, sobbing. Scarrett felt both moved and uncomfortable, she understood that Victoria needed to have a chaperone by staying alone in a bedroom with a man, even though that man was badly hurt and unconscious so as not to feed the slanderous rumors and preserve her image. She also understood why Victoria had not wanted to have a chaperone on this occasion to Lazen, because with Lazen present Victoria could not have given free rein to her feelings and unburden openly, by her age, very close to that of the Queen, Victoria and she could be friends, if not for the abysmal difference of social status between them, but Victoria felt more relaxed in her presence than with Lazen, who was like her mother but a strict and rigid mother, in any case. Scarrett understood the Queen and was proud to be worthy of her trust, but she felt no less uncomfortable witnessing such a intimate scene between the Queen and the man she loved, she felt like an intruder and a voyeur. So she turned around and turned her back on them as she looked out the window, trying to give them some privacy. Lord M don't die, please. I need you, you don't know how much I need you. You cannot leave me alone, you cannot. You are my life Lord M. If you die, I die, my love. Said Victoria, her face bathed in tears, her face very close to Lord Melbourne's face. Scarrett was also crying, in silence, and wiping away the tears with the palm of one hand, she felt a deep compassion for the Queen and her beautiful love story. I love you. I love you William. Victoria said, forgetting all etiquette or prejudice, calling by his first name to Lord Melbourne, that day, at Brockett Hall. I did not tell you with these words, but now I do. I love you. I think I have loved you since the first day I saw you in Kensington, and since then you have conquered me, with you I feel protected, loved, admired, understood, for the first time in my life I felt that someone believed in me. Do you see Lord M? I cannot give my heart to anyone because it's already yours, and now you are going to leave me alone? You cannot. You cannot leave me alone. How can I continue to live in this world if you are not? Please, my love, do not go. Stay with me William. Stay with me. Victoria dared to lay her lips on those of Lord Melbourne, and laid upon them a sad and tender kiss which Scarrett saw out of the corner of her eye. I don't want to live if you are not. Stay with me or I will not be able to move on. I need you so much, Lord M. Do not leave me alone. I beg you. Victoria continued, then kissed her lips again. Then Victoria burst into tears on Lord Melbourne's lap, Scarrett felt she had to intervene. Your Majesty, please, you must rest and Lord Melbourne too. It's been many hours since your last meal, and you've suffered a lot. I beg you, Majesty, you must rest and eat, if you want to help Lord Melbourne you must be strong for him. It's no use if you get sick too, you cannot stay too long, at least not now with everyone outside. Please, let's go to your bedroom to rest and feed, and later you can visit Lord Melbourne again. You know they'll keep her informed of anything that happens to him, do it for you and Lord Melbourne, he needs you strong, ma'am, Scarrett said, moving closer to Victoria and standing by her side. You're right Scarrett, you're right. But I'll be back later, Victoria said. Of course, 
Your Majesty. Victoria stood and tears streaming down her cheeks, she glanced at Lord Melbourne, she put a hand to her lips, kissed her fingers, and then put them on Lord Melbourne's lips. Then she wiped the tears with a handkerchief that Scarrett gave her, recovered a little, apparently, and made an effort to stop crying, and now, she went to the door and waited for Scarrett to open the door, and went out into the hall where a group of people were waiting for whom she did not want to attend at that moment. And in all that haste allowed the courtesy, went to her bedroom, but not before insisting the doctor to do everything possible to save Lord Melbourne. Victoria could not sleep that night, she spent all her time awake, sometimes crying, sometimes lying with her eyes open, staring at the ceiling. Sometimes she was drowsy, but then she had nightmares in which she saw Lord Melbourne dead, after the last one, when she woke up screaming, causing Scarrett and Lazen to run to see what was happening to her, she made the two women accompany her through the dark corridors of the palace, in the middle of the night, to go to the bedroom where was staying Lord Melbourne to see if he was okay. The nurse on duty in the dormitory guarding the wounded Prime Minister was stunned when she saw the Queen and her two companions appear, the three women in their night clothes, still impressed, responded the Queen's questions and reassuring her, making her see that Lord Melbourne had not worsened. The next morning Victoria was exhausted, physically and psychologically, yet she had to face not only her constant concern for Lord Melbourne, but also her duties as Queen. She had an audience with John Russell, Secretary of State for War and the Colonies, who by decision of his cabinet colleagues temporarily held the post of Prime Minister, Victoria asked him to continue interimly at the head of the government, until to saw the outcome of Lord Melbourne's situation. The acting Prime Minister informed her that the man who had attacked her was a radical who had been arrested by the police in the past, a solitary and fanatical man, somewhat disturbed, who had been on the continent in revolutionary movements, and who had been linked to the Chartists, Victoria recalled when she spoke with Lord Melbourne to commute the death penalty for exile to some Chartists, the man had acted alone and had seduced a maid to be able to sneak into the rooms of the palace. Servants and thus finally to be able to infiltrate in palace and to attack against the Queen. Victoria only expressed her wish that the whole weight of the law should fall on him, everything that happened seemed unreal, as if it were a nightmare or something that was happening to someone else. All day Victoria passed expectantly, going back and forth from Lord Melbourne's bedroom, and when she was not in his bedroom she constantly asked for him, she would have liked to stay all the time beside his bed, but she knew she could not do it, to keep the rumors from growing. The hours continued to pass slowly, and when Victoria was sitting at her desk trying unsuccessfully to concentrate on the official documents, Lazen came and Victoria was startled, as every time someone came, fearing a fatal news. Your Majesty. Lord Melbourne has awakened, said Lazen, unable to conceal a certain emotion from knowing what that meant to her Dina. Victoria's face brightened and she jumped to her feet, picking up her skirt, almost running, passing like lightning beside Lazen. D.R.I. Your Majesty, do not run, please. The Queen must never run. Lazen chided her lightly, as when she was a child in Kensington and things were a little easier. When Victoria reached the bedroom, followed closely by a breathless Lazen, she saw Melbourne conversing feebly with the doctor and her eyes met, and Lord Melbourne smiled on his emaciated face, a smile that shook Victoria to tears, she was about to run towards him, but Lazen with discretion grabbed her by the arm. Majesty, please wait to be alone with him, do not show your feelings in front of everyone, Lazen whispered in her ear. Victoria paid attention to her, though her whole body trembled with emotion, Victoria exchanged a few words with the doctor about the state of Lord Melbourne while he was contemplating as if not with him. Doctor, if you'll excuse me, I must speak to Lord Melbourne about matters of state, confidential, which cannot wait. They're urgent, Victoria said, trying to sound serene and professional. Of course your majesty, but the patient is still serious, it must not be exhausted replied the doctor. I'll be brief, Victoria said. Your majesty, with your permission. We will offer the doctor a night tea, Lazen said. Good idea, Baroness Lazen, thank you, 
said Victoria. Lazen led the doctor and the nurses out, followed by Scarat, then glanced at Victoria as if to say behave yourself girl, and closed the door, leaving them alone. Victoria walked over to the bed and saw Lord Melbourne directly to eyes. Ma'am I am glad to see that you are well, Lord Melbourne said in a weak broken voice, his eyes glazed, his face as pale as a corpse. Victoria opened her mouth to say something, but the emotion did not allow her to speak, she sat up in bed and could not contain herself, she leaned her body on Lord Melbourne's chest and began to cry like a little girl. Lord Melbourne was shocked and touched, and lifting heavily a hand he placed it on Victoria's head, stroking her hair. Ma'am, you must not put yourself like this, normally the tears come at the funeral, not before, said Lord Melbourne. Shut up fool. It's not funny. Victoria almost screamed between mortified and angry. Lord Melbourne was astonished, for Victoria had never spoken to him like this. Sorry, ma'am, it's not really funny, do not cry over this old fool, it's not worth it, said Melbourne sweetly. Lord M, you don't know what I have suffered. I was so afraid of losing you. I was going crazy with pain. Is it that you still do not understand? Victoria said with her face very close to the face of Lord Melbourne, I have to tell you. I love you. I love you Lord M. I love you William. I love you more than my own life. Please ma'am, please do not say any more. Do not commit yourself in that way. Lord Melbourne replied, feeling that his voice was failing, and holding back his tears. No. This time you're not going to shut me up. I'm tired of shutting up. That day at Brockett Hall I wanted to tell you what I felt, but the protocol and my dimity did not allow me to express without hesitation what I felt, now I can do it. What I feel is love Lord M. I love you. You are my life. You are my reason to live my love. You may think that I am a little girl, that I don't know what true love is, that I have not lived long enough to know. But I know. By God I know. I feel something I cannot express in words. I only know that if you leave my life I wish I were dead. I don't want to live without you, I don't want to. Lord Melbourne closed his eyes, then opened them with an expression of sadness, of torment. I never thought that you don't know what love is, ma'am. There are people who can live eighty years and never know love, never get to feel it, on the other hand. There are people with 15 or 16 years of life who already know and feel it, even the greatest love of their life. I have not doubted for a moment the strength and sincerity of your feelings, said Lord Melbourne as if it will cost him to speak for the emotion. Then, you can tell me that you feel for me. I need to know, I need you to tell me the truth, that you swear on your honor or the most sacred thing for you. I need you to tell me, without subterfuge, without half measures, without veiled or coded expressions, I need you to confess what you feel for me, even if it's not what I want to hear, but I need to know if you love me as I love you, Victoria begged. Lord Melbourne breathed deeply, as if seeking strength, and then spoke in a somewhat clearer and more firm voice. Ma'am. Victoria. I love you. I love you Victoria. I love you like I've never loved any woman. I love you more than I loved my wife even at the time when I was happy with her. I never thought I would love a woman again, and after my son died, I thought my heart was dead and I would not feel any emotion again, but you gave me back my life and my heart. You are the only reason I have to live, my love. Said Lord Melbourne with sincere emotion. Victoria was crying and smiling at the same time, with a sweet gesture of joy on her face. But, but then, why? Why? Victoria asked in a rung-up voice. Why do I rejected you? Do not you understand Victoria? I had to do it for you. You have no idea what I had to do. My heart broke as much or more than yours. I wanted to say yes, kiss you and hug you, and accept your proposal, but I could not. The Queen of Great Britain married to a simple Viscount, who is old enough to be her father and that above is a politician at the end of his career, 
the leader of a party and Prime Minister of Her Majesty? Your Prime Minister, ma'am. They will never accept it. They will not let you marry me Victoria. It would be a constitutional crisis. And if you insisted Victoria, your enemies would have used it to say that you are not ready to reign, you would give the reason to those miserable people who wanted to incapacitate you, who even wanted to declare you crazy, to impose a regency, so that they take away your functions and give them to you to a regent, and you are practically imprisoned for the rest of your life, or worse, they force you to abdicate, to renounce the crown. I could not let them do that to you. But it was not your decision Lord M. It must have been my decision. She exclaimed in a tone of anger and pity. It's mine, too, ma'am. Besides, it was not just for you, it was also for Britain, for our country, since I saw you Victoria, I saw greatness in you. I believed in you because I saw that you had the potential to be a great queen, and this country needs a good monarch. Our last two kings, your uncles, were terrible monarchs, instead, you, you have great qualities and you have a great sense of duty. A young girl who, despite the adversity in which she grew up, had the strength to fulfill her obligations and confront those who wanted to manipulate her for own interests. In these times Britain needs a queen who can unite the nation, who can strengthen the faith of the people in our institutions, and ensure that we continue along the path between tradition and change, reform without violence, avoiding violent disorders that shake the continent, the bloody and anarchic revolution, if you lose the crown. Do you think any of your greedy uncles can unite the nation and arouse loyalty in the people? With one of your petty relatives in the throne, the stability of this country would be in serious danger, could you live with that in the Victoria consciousness? If you had to abdicate to marry me, and you simply became the Viscountess of Melbourne, and if the country went off on a precipice, would not you end up repenting for not doing your duty, for giving up the role you were destined for God or by fate? You were not born to be a simple housewife, a second-rate aristocrat who withers in a country residence next to an older husband. Do not kid yourself Victoria, you're not an ordinary woman, and we both love this country too much, and we'd feel guilty about hurting it. I understand what you say, but still, you gave up so easily. Answered with great sadness Victoria. Easily. With ease you say? Lord Melbourne replied in pain in a tone of bitter reproach, almost offended, it's the most painful thing I've ever had to do. Only the day I had to bury my poor son I felt as much pain as I felt that day. To see you leave with a broken heart, feeling that I lost you forever, was for me as bitter as when I saw the coffin of my son descending to the grave. How can I explain what I felt? For me it was the end of my last illusion in life. If I lose you, my only reason to live dies. Do you know what makes me suffer Victoria every day? To think about what will happen the day you marry another and also I stopped being your Prime Minister, what will become of me later? I will tell you, spend my last years of life locked in my lonely house, suffering for your absence, mortified knowing that you are in the arms of another man, that you share his bed, that he makes you his. You know what I have done Victory? I prayed to God that the day that happens, take my life fast, and not have to live many years in that hell, for me death would be a blessing if I have to live without you. Easy, you say? May they condemn me to hell, if was easy for me. Oh Lord M, my sweet Lord M. Victoria exclaimed and without thinking twice kissed him on the lips, a deep and tender kiss. Victoria, please, someone can see us. Lord Melbourne said to her, when she separated her lips of his lips. And that's why you are going to give up on my kisses? Victoria asked with a sweet smile and bright eyes. No, I will not, Melbourne replied, and brought his lips to hers, and they kissed for a long time. When Victoria came out of the bedroom, she had a pretty blush on her cheeks, and she had to avoid Lazen's gaze so as not to see the suspicion and reproach in the Baroness's eyes but the joy she felt was clouded when the doctor explained that Lord Melbourne was still in danger of death, that a relapse was still possible. That filled her with fear, but then, when she was alone was more joy of remembering of Lord Melbourne's kisses, 
lying on her bed, she put her fingers to her lips and closed her eyes, and then she hugged a pillow and buried her face in it. The next day Victoria visited Lord Melbourne several times, and on one occasion sought an excuse to stay alone with him, they talked tenderly and she managed to kiss him again, despite his fear of being discovered. At night Victoria walked down one of the hallways of the palace with a lamp in her hand, watching the portraits of her ancestors, she stopped before the portrait of George III and she stared at it for a long time. What would you do in my place, grandfather? I mean before you lost your mind, of course. Sure, you were a man and you had something easier. Victoria meditated a lot, and finally made a decision, the next day she gathered in her office with Lazen, Lord Alfred, Emma Portman, Lord Melbourne's great friend and Lady of the Bedchamber of Victoria, the Duchess of Sutherland, Mistress of the Robes and Friend of Victoria, and, to the surprise of the others, to Scarat. I have gathered my friends and faithful servers, because I have made a very important decision, and I need your help to execute it. This decision is the result of careful meditation on my part, and I assure you that I have not taken it lightly. I hope your understanding, and your support, said Victoria solemnly and trying to subdue the emotion, I have decided to get Mary Lord Melbourne in his bed, in the danger of his death.